I found out something very unsettling about Harry. He gambles. What do you mean he gambles? He plays craps in the back room of a private club. I mean, you know, you eleven, come on, little Joe. Uh, snake eyes, hard way eight. That's how it goes. He loses a lot of money. You had no idea? No, I didn't. Welcome to the Crap Vegas Podcast. Vegas, here we come. Vegas. Here are your hosts, Chris and Josh. Welcome to the Crap Vegas Podcast. I'm Chris, he's Josh, and we couldn't be happier to get this thing finally going. Josh, how are you doing on this wonderful Sunday afternoon? I'm doing well. You say it like it's been forever since we've been planning this, telling people that we're going to release a podcast. <laughs> I mean, it may have been three, four months, but we'll just call it a couple days and pretend nobody ran, noticed. I think you ran a contest for for to get followers like <laughs> three months ago. <laughs> Yeah, it might have been a little bit ago. And you know what? Those followers are very excited that we're finally here today and we're not going to lie to them anymore. Sure. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. Make no promises as to when our next one will drop. But. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll say two weeks from now. And it'll be sometime in 2023. But everyone, welcome to the Crap Vegas podcast. This is the inaugural podcast that has been a long time coming. We have multiple ways that you can reach out to us. You can email us at podcast at crapvegas.com. We have a text slash voicemail line that we hope to utilize a lot more in the future to make this more interactive. That phone number is 702 978 7775. Or by far the easiest way is always going to be on Twitter. He's at Vegas Duffy. I'm at Small Whale 13. So, Josh, let's start off with the fun question for every gambler. How did you get started doing this crazy thing? Well, I started playing cards. I think my grandma uh, was was the one that got me into cards. And that's the story with so many people. And, you know, playing, I don't remember what we played, but cribbage was one of the games that I learned. It was Pinochle on. for me. So, yeah, I can relate. Oh, yeah, a little Pinochle. And then I played Pinochle in college. And then I went to college in this little town that was right across the border from another state that has had legalized blackjack in supper clubs. And so I would go down after college, during college, and then after I graduated, I stayed and worked there and worked in town and would go across the border and play blackjack at the little supper club. And they had a, also had a poker game. So I'd go in and play poker with these old farmers and just got cleaned out again and again and again and again. <laughs> And, and they just kept inviting you back for more, amazingly. Just, just kept, kept inviting me back. And then I was working for, I worked for Pizza Hut. And we got, uh, this is like 1990, I don't know, somewhere, 1997, something like that. Got invited to a, to a, uh, a Pizza Hut, you know, corporate event thing, convention in Vegas. And stayed at the MGM Grand and they gave us some money to gamble with. And this is the this is the story, I've told this on Twitter, but where I met John Madden at the craps table, my very mm-hmm. first trip to Las Vegas. And was playing craps, and that was that was the beginning of that adventure. So that was it for me. But I grew up with with you know my mom used to take me to horse races when I was little, you know. So I grew up with you know I wouldn't say hardcore gambling, but uh, there there are rumors. I don't know this to be true that my grandfather once once lost a house in a card mm-hmm. game, but <laughs> <laughs> which was this, this is the same grandma that taught me to play cards, but they were long since divorced, so okay. no idea well, if that's yeah. true or not. But <laughs> anyway, a greater it's been, story uh, there. How about you? you? You know, I the good news is for those that want the really detailed story, I just got done writing like 2000 words and I didn't even begin to touch it for our new website, which we can now safely announce to people because if they're hearing this, they'll know about it, which is crapvegas.com. Um, but my story goes, you know, I wasn't a big gambler as a kid. My family is all kind of devout Baptists. So, you know, gambling and drinking were absolutely no no's. Ironically, I went to a Catholic school, though. Uh, so you are surrounded by all those things, but it never just really picked up for me, uh, honestly, until I got to college and one buddy uh, just randomly one day said, hey, you know, you can gamble when you're 19 up in Canada. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. That sounds like fun. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, let's let's go up this weekend. It'll be super fun. And that one trip led to just you know, tons of credit card debt, getting in over my head (laughs) way before I ever should. It landed me a job at that same casino a year later uh, where I worked for a couple, you know, a couple summers then for a full year when I got out of college. Um, So it just all kind of went downhill from there. It was all blackjack at the beginning. 
craps didn't exist at the time for me. You know that craps didn't really start for me until God, six months ago, a year ago. I, I did it. Yeah. You know, I, no, it's I've funny. Kinda, as you, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I've gone you. down, I've gone down that AP blackjack path. Um, so, you know, I've done that. I've made good money out of it. Uh, and the good news is Nate, now I can't get, you know, walked away or backed off from any tables playing crafts. So no, this is crafts much easier. Good, yeah. You no, can't but get go ahead. Trouble. Oh, I was going to say, now that you mention it, we did some trips, the same thing. One of my, you know, we must've been, I guess, 18, 19, went across to up into Canada, play some blackjack. And, and, uh, that was probably my first place that I did legalized, you know, <laughs> under 21 gambling. Now, I will tell you, uh, you know, this is mentioned in my article, but I don't know why the only time in my life I've ever been to a strip club was in Canada. And they're Canadian strip clubs, man. It's a whole different world from what I understand American strip clubs are like. (laughs) So if there just happens to be any 19-year-old that's listening to this podcast, why, I have no idea. But if you are, I highly encourage you to cross the Canadian border and visit a strip (laughs) club. You don't need to gamble. You'll probably spend about the same amount of money all in, but at the end of the day, you'll have a great time and you cannot lose going there. And can't you, I mean, I, it's been a long time since I was that age, but can't you drink there too? If you're under 21? Oh, sure. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. 19 or over, you can drink, you can gamble, you can do anything you want. They serve liquor in their strip clubs. They're fully nude. I mean, you have everything you could possibly want. I mean, they just, they're all out in Canada. (laughs) Chris is oh. making us sound like degenerates. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Um. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so, so Josh, before we get too far lost on Canadian strip clubs, which we'll probably have to do a completely separate podcast about, uh, sure, we'll work on that as well. We'll get to that next year as well. Strip I, stripping, I, stripping you know, Vegas. I don't. Know. Yeah, 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 stripping Vegas, tipping Vegas, all the ones. We'll have all sorts of different ones. You posed the question a while back before we even started recording this thing how we're going to be different than other podcasts. And I think that's a terrific question because I have no answer to it. Um, But the one thing I can say is that we've played together a lot in Vegas. We're we're fairly similar players. We like the same sort of things. But one thing we don't plan on doing on this is shilling for any, you know, one particular entity. We're not getting paid by anybody, which I know is a hot topic right now on Vegas Twitter. We're not trying to collect money to front some restaurant that is actually horrible and tell you it's amazing or anything like that. Our goal is just to share some stories that we have from craps tables, you know, more about our background, things that we like, things we don't like, and just see how it goes. This is, you know, very learn as we go for us. And I'll I'll say just on top of that, you're absolutely right. We're, you know, we'll have our favorites and we do have our favorites that we'll, we'll, (laughs) I think everybody knows that about us. Yeah, exactly. Talk fondly about, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, if a time ever comes where we're offered anything or compensated for anything, I think we would certainly disclose that. Um, and when we think about what this podcast is going to be, I think both of us are huge fans of, you can bet on that and Mark and Dr. Mike and, and if we have a little bit of, of a tinge of, of them in us, um, I take that as a compliment and we both, we both really enjoy that. And if you want to support a, a podcast, uh, we encourage you to visit, you can bet on that and click on the Amazon, Amazon link at the top of their page. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We don't have a referral link, but we would love right. it if you supported them. They're two awesome right. people. They're by far my favorite thing to listen to every couple of weeks when it comes out. And if we and can even come of, close... And- I mean, yeah. If we can come close to mimicking them, then I'm perfectly fine with that because they seem like two amazing people um, and definitely want them to do well. Absolutely. And then quite a few other other Vegas and gambling related podcasts and, and too many to mention right now. But I know I'm sure they'll come up over time as we go along. But you can bet on that is one that we'll, we certainly uh, both listen to fondly as, at, with every release. You know, as I'm working on this website in the background, I will add some links to our favorite podcast, like everybody else <laughs> on the side, so we can get those referral links over to them, and maybe they'll refer back one day and life will be good. But that being said, so when we asked for questions from individuals, I will say I'm surprised because we got a ton. Um, I have 15 or 20 on a page in front of me, and I stopped checking the text messages at least a week ago, um, so I'm sure there's a bunch more in there. Um, we won't get through them all, but the biggest thing that people ask over and over again is why we support the win so much. What is it that sets it apart from everybody else? And I'll start the conversation by saying I was never a win fanboy. Um, Josh actually converted me over to join the family. 
I was, you know, I was a big Caesars guy for a long time. I did seven stars with them. I jumped over to MGM, got up to platinum with them. I think as a table game player, getting noir with them is almost impossible. It feels like, but that being said, I think I've stayed at almost every property in Vegas at this point. And, you know, when was just never on my radar. It just, it wasn't as a blackjack player. It didn't make sense to me. Uh, so Josh, I mean, what is it that drew you in of it originally to the win? Well, so I started like so many people, I think in our community started as Caesars, you know, primarily Caesars, Caesars players. And the first place I ever got comped at a room was Imperial Palace in Vegas. <laughs> Classic. And, yeah, exactly. And stayed there, you know, just countless time and slowly worked my way up through the Caesars uh, ecosystem to where I was getting comped. You know, I mean, I, I stayed almost all the time at Paris. That was kind of my regular, regular spot. And uh, I am, in addition to being a craft player, food driven mm. <laughs> and found my way uh, over to Bellagio at some point. And actually, this is going to sound terrible, but ate at the buffet and really liked the buffet at Bellagio. That's and all it took. It's all it took. And I had a host one time that said at Bellagio that said, you know, he'd give me I had whatever the corporate offer was. I'm just going to make up numbers. But let's say it was fifty dollars in free play and fifty dollars in food and beverage. And he said he would give me more than whatever the corporate offer was. And that was enough to sway me over to Bellagio, you know, get two free buffets and a hundred dollars in free play or something like that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And then, and that really became my, you know, my home base. And we'll talk more about that, you know, over the, over time, but that became my home base, home base for a number of years. And then I'd stayed at Win two or three times, you know, over the course of time, my wife would come down occasionally on business and I'd stay at Win and, we stayed once with my buddies and that kind of thing, but never really played much at Win. During COVID, you know, when Vegas closed down, I was looking to come back and I was really following um, how the different casino properties were treating their employees and what they were doing for, you know, guest cleanliness and sanitation and all that stuff. And, and you know, I just read over and over again how Win was going really further than anyone else as far as protecting its employees, keeping, you know, keeping their employees employed and paid. And, and, and then the steps they were taking, you know, kind of leading the way in, in making guests feel safe. And who knows, you know, how effective that, that was in reality, but, sure. but they did a good job at, at least in, in going, you know, through the effort and, and putting together a program and that kind of thing. So I reached out to a host just proactively and, and uh, found a host online and uh, through LinkedIn, I think, and reached out and said, Here's who I am. Here's how I play. Here are the you know what I what I usually spend on a trip and and you know the amount, length of time I play an average bet and so on. Would you be willing to to host me for a trip down? And he said absolutely. This was uh, July of 2020, I think. So I I went down and and uh, was treated exa- treated exactly like I expected to be treated and really fell in love with the property from a you know a, again food driven uh, uh, their room service menu is is the best in Las Vegas. Those steak nachos are pretty (laughs) darn good. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, of course, obviously the, the dealers, the craft dealers are just, you know, fantastic and top notch. And, and I don't mean to say anything against another property. Bellagio will talk again about it, but has, you know, some of the dealers that I'm closest to in all of Las Vegas. Oh, for sure. Um, but you know, just the, the dealers at Wynn are are so professional and, and most of them super friendly. And so the two things combined and of course the, the product, the room product and the hotel itself and the resort, uh, just can't be beat. And so, uh, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, I think you are too. We, we play enough that um, they're going to, they're going to take care of us. And uh, if you can get that at the top, the top tier property, then that's what you go for. For sure. And I, I think you hit a couple things that in a future episode, we'll have to talk more about, about being proactive with hosts. Uh, I think that's a question I get on Twitter randomly more than anything is how do you get a host? And yeah. I don't want to bog down this episode with that, but I, I think what Josh said is is by far the crux of it. If you're proactive and either stop in person at the host desk and just introduce yourself and explain your play level and see if they're interested, or just shooting an email, finding somebody off their website, off LinkedIn, all those things can be very beneficial. You don't need to wait for them to come to you. Going to the right. host first is usually much easier. And you will but, at some properties, you will, sorry, Chris, you, you will have a host. If you don't have a host, sometimes a host will come and find you. But oh, sure. I haven't found, for me, I haven't found that happen very frequently. Usually it's me, you know, it's me being proactive and going to the desk or, you know, like I said, on email, contacting, 
you know, contacting a host and just saying, here's, here's, I did that at Venetian too. Now that I think of it, I reached out, you know, found a host online, probably through LinkedIn and reached out and, and same thing. They, you know, he said, absolutely. We'll host you. No, same thing for me. I did it at Cosmo when I was first making my jump over there to try them out. Um, just walked up to a host desk and was able to get in touch, get everything set up. And same thing at Bellagio, where I, th- I think as table players, it's slightly harder than it is a slot player to get that initial recognition. Um, because I, I, I'm sure. not sure what drives that, but you know, slot players are far more valuable than table games players are at the end of the day, unless you're getting to the extremes, you know, the fifty to seventy five thousand dollar hand players. That's a different story, but. Those everyday slot players, I think they look to pick up a little bit quicker. And folks, for, if you're listening, we are not fifty to seventy five thousand dollars hand slot. <laughs> no, no, blackjack God, players. No, are- do not be fooled. That is that is anything but the case. There has been no YouTube documentaries made about us at this point. Uh, and we if there was, it probably would that. not be for the yeah, <laughs> might not be for the right reason, anyways. Right. So, so let's let's get into some of the questions that people have sent in. Um, I had a couple of them that were recorded, but it was just easier to type these out. And in the future, as you guys send in your voicemails, we'll roll with that and try to get going. But, you know, the first question kind of ties with what you were just asking, Josh. Somebody asked us, uh, what does it take to be a high roller in Vegas? And this is a multifaceted question because the answer varies from property to property. So, Josh, I'll let you start on it. Well, I don't know what it takes to be a high roller. Um you know, when I was, when it's I was kind playing, of a loaded term, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. When I was, and I think it, you know, I mean, I like to, to tell people and, and say occasionally on Twitter, I mean, I, I don't think of myself as a high roller. Like I say, I started, I was getting comped at, at Imperial Palace and I was getting sure, comped yeah. at Circus Circus and I've stayed at Casino Royale and I've stayed at uh, the Circus Circus Manor Motor Lodge. And, and, you know, so I still, you know, I, I th- don't think of myself anymore as a, as a $5 craps player, you know, $5 table craps player. But at the same time, I, I don't think of myself at, you know, as a high roller either, but um, I was getting, you know, what I, what I played at Bellagio when I was getting comped, you know, regularly at Bellagio with, with plenty of food and beverage and some free play was, was a um, hundred and what was it? Chris, you can help me. $135 across yeah, and a, at probably, a $25 yeah. table. You yeah, know, and if you're hour. playing that level at Bellagio, that's plenty to get you to get you, you know, nicely comped. Anytime you want to come and visit, they'll be glad sure. to host you. And so, you know, now at Wynn, I think Wynn, uh, my host told me at one time, and I don't know this, you know, to be a fact or anything more than that, you know, that Wynn expects you to have an average bed in craps of two hundred and fifty dollars. As the and this may have been, you know, maybe it's changed since you know, things got busier after COVID. You know, that I can't say. But uh, when I first talked to my host, that was kind of what they expected was a $250 average and about four to five hours of play a day to be hostable at win. And that was for just RFB, just the basics. Correct. Correct. Now, I don't even know if it was for RFB. It was just to be, you know, just to get a room. <laughs> it's just R. Yeah. <laughs> right. The most basic of basic. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, for, for people who don't know what RFB is, room, food and beverage. Um, I, I think I got pretty early on. Uh, he was, my host was taking care of food and beverage, but I, you know, I don't remember if that was a corporate offer or just, you know, at the beginning, but yeah, for sure. Um, but How yeah, I, I think pro- I mean, property to property, I think is the, the big driver here. So, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, I was traditionally a blackjack player and that's where 90% of my history is going to be. You know, if, if I'm playing two, three, four hundred dollars a hand at blackjack, If I do that on the strip at most places, probably other than Caesar's Palace and probably when you can get almost anything that you want at that level or higher. Right. Um, They're going to cover all your transport. They're going to cover your room, your food, your beverages, you know, maybe your spa stuff. I mean, most places have a tendency to exclude sundry items and, you know, shop purchases. That's that's fairly normal. But, you know, at that kind of level, you can get almost anything that you want and you really don't have to ask too terribly much. You take that same level of play downtown. If you don't get backed off first, they may send (laughs) a plane to pick you up next time you're coming. Um, So, I mean, it it does depend. I mean, if for those that are looking to get in and find a host somewhere, you know, start with some of the smaller properties. Go to Treasure Island, especially the independent properties. Um, If you're a blackjack player, there is no better place on the strip to play blackjack than Treasure Island. It is terrific. It's low level. It's got the best rules. Their high limit sometimes opens at 25 bucks for the day. They'll treat you like royalty if you're giving them 25 or $50 bets on a blackjack table. They have great drink service most of the time. 
it, it's just a great play for people that are just getting going into it. And that's the difference. You know, you talk about that with blackjack. That's the difference with craps is, is with craps, obviously the game, you know, a few exceptions, but for the most part, the game is the same in every property. Sure. Yeah. You know, you're playing, you're playing the same rules again, you know, you might have triple the 12 in the field and that kind of thing, but for the most part, it's the same rules. So for me, I mean, that's why the, the room product and the, the food and beverage amenities are what, are what, you know, to some extent the dealers, but, but first the room product and the food and beverage that are, that are kind of driving my decisions. And obviously, I, you know, I, I, I love great crews and that kind of thing, but I found oh, that sure, you can yeah. also find great crews at, you know, at any property. Tons of properties. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I know you and I had a stint at Resorts World there for a while. Um, I'm, I'm a fairly big proponent of Resorts World. I like the people there. I like the layout of the casino. The rooms are terrific. Um, you know, great crews over there. One thing I will mention about the wind that I think we've mentioned before, it's important to keep in mind with the wind, they really value their room product. There's a large price on that in their eyes. Whereas Caesars will give you a free hotel room effectively anywhere in the world if you're even yes. a moderate player and they don't really consider it. Wynn does. Getting a free room there is a big deal, even if you're not getting food and beverage or transport or anything else like that. I mean, Josh and I were just there Monday through Wednesday of this week. And when we looked up the room prices just for a basic room, it was like $700 a night which is insane during the week. I have no idea what was going on in Vegas earlier this week. I think it was $900 a night. Was it? It, it might, it yeah, might have been. It we saw a couple conventions that were taking place at Wynn, but there's nothing to be driving that price up as much as it was. But that plays into your comparability at the end of the day, because if they're assigning 1500 bucks to just the room itself, it requires a heck of a lot more play than going over to you know Planet Hollywood and getting $400 worth of room. Right. And again, it, it really depends on what's important to you. And we'll, I know we'll talk more about value and that kind of thing as we go forward. But sure, yeah. It, it, one, of the, one of the things, Chris, I don't know if you ever did this, but when I used to play at Caesars, and I don't mean Caesars proper, but Caesars properties. Properties, you know, If I was yeah. staying at Paris or wherever I was staying, you know, I might get an offer for three nights. And I would actually stay two nights, but I would keep that third night so I could leave late. And, you know, I didn't, at that sure. point, I was, I, I didn't care if I was, you know, that extra room was was nice and I would never do that at win because I don't want to no. have that <laughs> that uh, no. that nine hundred that seven hundred dollar working against me for you know that kind of, for future benefit that kind of thing. And well, you know, Josh, a lot of people book multiple offers on the same trip. Now I can safely say I have never done that. I really <laughs> haven't. So if there's any host out there listening, I promise you, I have never done this before, and I would never do that to you. But others you, do do this. They'll book multiple properties, get multiple deals for the same week. And I guess as long as you're giving them the play level that they expect, there's no problem there. Well, that's the, the I'm not going to say whether or not I have ever done such a thing, Chris. But, <laughs> that sounds but suspicious. I, <laughs> but I will say that that I agree with you. I, if I ever would do that or had done that, I would never do it with the idea that I was going to burn a property. No. Um, I would always have the intent of, you know, maybe maybe I booked two different properties because I wanted to try out one and, and you know, th that kind of thing or or I wanted the offer that I was getting, but I would always try and give exactly what was expected of me to to each property, and and that's sure. important to me because I don't want to burn those those bridges. I'm not. No, I don't you know, either. I, I value relationships pretty strongly, especially with the hosts that I can I really enjoy, and I would never want to you know burn one of them. So it, it bit me in the future. And if so there is a property, oh sorry, I didn't mean interrupt you. You're if fine, there is Josh, a property that. Uh, we're still getting the hang of this, folks. Yeah, there's going to be a <laughs> if, lot of interruptions. Get used to it. <laughs> if there is a property that that I feel like I haven't given sufficient play to, I make a point to go back there. Even you know, I know in the long run that's just silly, and, and but to me it means something. I don't want to, you know, I'm not someone that's trying to get a free ride just to get a free ride. I, you know, I, I recognize that that you know that that's based on my gambling, and I try and give them the fair play. No, for sure, I agree with that. So let's talk about credit lines. Um, a couple of questions came in about credit lines. There's a lot of talk on Twitter about it recently. Are credit lines worth setting up? And, and, and is that something that you would entertain, you know, for all gamblers out there? Well, I think that uh, there's a plus and minus to a credit to a line of credit at a casino. And um, the, the plus, obviously, is you have access to, you know, whatever your, whatever your line of credit is, credit is, you have access to that amount of money without having to bring cash. And it's... Um, I once heard, you know, saw on Twitter and that's that to be recognized uh, as a, you know, as a kind of a bigger player, uh, you need to have a $10,000 line of credit downtown 
and a $25,000 line of credit on the strip. And, and, and a, a casino will recognize you. Their ears will perk up a little bit if they know you have on the strip, let's say, a $25,000 line of credit. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that gets you. <laughs> but <laughs> it, get, it gets you on their radar, I think. Right, is, gets is you the on their radar. They, they're serious about it. And I know, you know, you've had experiences, you might talk about it, where, you know, setting up a line of credit, you know, gets you a ride. You know, even if you've never stayed at the property before, they'll, they'll pick you up in a limo from the airport and, and, you know, that kind of thing. It does. I always tell people that a credit line alone does not get you comps. And it absolutely does not. If your level of play doesn't support it, then you know, you're either going to end up in a situation where you're overcomped and they could try to claw back some money on the back end as you're leaving. It, it, don't use that as a, as a tool to get yourself a comp from the beginning. That being said, especially if it's a new property that you don't have a lot of experience with, setting up that credit line not only is probably going to get you in contact with a host very quickly, depending on the line that you set up, because this is cash that they know is available for you to spend on the trip. Right. Uh, but it may get you a couple things up front that you may not have got. You may get that room that, you know, they wanted to have one trip under their belt or they may have comped it on the back end. You may get it up front by setting up that line. But beyond that, for me at least, credit is just an invaluable tool. I mean, it's one of those things. I have it set up at probably 80% of the properties in Vegas that I play at consistently. And now I always have to walk the line of trying to get by there once every six months or so so they don't turn the line off. Uh, but having that you know, credit at those properties, I no longer have to bring large sums of cash. I don't have to wire money into the cage and pay fees for getting it there and getting it back. It makes life so much easier. Uh, but like Josh said, there is a big downside to this credit. If you have any proclivity to be a you know, problem gambler that doesn't know when to quit and you ignore those pamphlets that are next to the cashier that nobody ever looks at, then a credit line can be disastrous. Um, because especially, I mean, I say, especially at Vegas properties, it's a little different here at home where I am, but in Vegas properties, if you ask for a marker, there will be lammers on the table and cash will be pushed out within 10 seconds. It's almost guaranteed. They're not going to ask questions. You're not going to sign anything first. That money's going to be given to you. So if that's a problem for you, do not open a line of credit. It will not make sense and you will kill yourself on that stuff. And that's what I was going to say, Chris. I was going to say that the downside, and you really, you really, talked about it nicely is the downside to it is you have access to that money so easily. And this is what I tell people who ask about lines of credit. Let's say, let's say you're, you're going to buy in at a table for $5,000 and, but your bankroll for this day maybe is $10,000. If you, but if you take cash and you have $5,000 in your wallet and you go down and you buy in for $5,000 at a craps table or a blackjack or wherever, and you lose that in 10 minutes, <laughs> however you're playing, if you carry it in cash and that's all you brought, you have to stop and pause and go to an ATM or go back to your room or go to a safety deposit box to get that money. Yes. If you have a line of credit, it's there at the snap of a finger. And that doesn't give you that, take a breath. Should I take a break? Should I go to a different table? Should I walk to, walk around, you know, do the casino stroll? You mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing. You don't have that with a line of credit unless you're, unless you're disciplined. But it's it's very easy to just say I'll take another marker for you know whatever amount of money it is, and and that's and the casinos that's they want you, they want that oh, they absolutely. absolutely want yeah. you to have that they don't want you to pause to go back to your room to get more cash or go to the ATM they want you to have it right there at the table, and so that's that's another reason they're you know they they want you to have a line of credit. No, I, I agree that's with the everything danger. that you said. Yeah, oh, it's 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 dangerous for sure, and, and I'll tell you I think the biggest difference is there's something. I don't know what it is, but there's something mentally about pulling that much cash out of your pocket, them having to spread it out. If you're giving them five grand, they're having to count out 2,500, put it to the side under the paddle, count out 2,500 more. It's a five, 10 minute process, potentially, depending on how the roll's going. And if there's a box there at the time, it's going to slow things down. Um, But especially on a credit line, your credit line is typically much larger than the markers that you're taking. So a person with a $10,000 credit line probably is only taking $1,500, $2,000 $1,500, markers. Um, so it does, you know, if you keep going back, oh, it's only 2000, it's only 2000. Next thing you know, you're out 10 grand. And I don't know if you're anything like me, Josh, I think you are, but our credit lines that we have established with, with these casinos, we never have any intention of losing that much money in a trip. 
If I do, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean big trouble like, you know, I'll get broken or anything like that. But but no. it would be, I would be very unhappy and I'd have to take a break for a while and, you know, that kind of thing. I, and I think having that large credit line comes in handy occasionally. You do go through, you know, bad swings where the variance gets horrible, especially on craps. Blackjack, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, but if you're somebody that doesn't want to lose more than, say, $5,000 for a trip, you may be in fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars into your line, effectively chasing, but we don't want to call it that because that has a negative connotation to it. <laughs> uh, but you know that line comes in handy from that perspective. But no, you don't want to lose the whole thing. And if it was in cash, I don't think it's as big of a deal. But let's, and there is, let's, you mentioned, oh sorry, Chris, you mentioned front money at one time. That's another option sure, for people yeah. that don't want to establish a line of credit. And for for folks that don't know what front money is, as Chris mentioned, you just wire funds ahead of time or during your visit to the to the casino and it and it acts like a line of credit in that you know that money that let's say you wire ten thousand dollars to the to the casino as front money that then you go to your to your table and say can i get two thousand dollars can i get a marker for two thousand dollars and that comes instead of off of your line of credit that comes off of your front money deposit and so that that's an option for people that that don't want to set up you know a line of credit but want the same you know the same idea the same and casinos like that too they're they're delighted to take front money um, you know, especially again, and, and, you know, the smaller property, the, the, you know, the lower tier, if you will, property you go to, the happier they are going to, to see all of those things. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. I don't think, you know, quite frankly, I don't think what, you know, you and I don't raise much of a blip at win. No, I don't uh, think so. You know, I, li- I like to think we do, but I don't think we do. <laughs> no, no, but, we don't. Uh, if, you know, if we did play more downtown, you know, I definitely think that, uh, <laughs> that you know the levels we play at and the lines of credit and that kind of thing would would their ears would perk up well you you uh you segue to a question that we have later on that I had listed but we'll we'll jump to it cuz you already touched on it a little bit one question i have heard multiple times and and got this a couple times a couple weeks ago is why we choose to be small fish in a big pond rather than big fish in a small pond why why in your eyes Josh do you prefer being a smaller player at win than say one of the bigger players at you know, the golden gate. Well, I think Chris, it kind of, and it, it's something I mentioned earlier for me, it's, it's not about the game. It's not about being, uh, sorry, it's not, it is about the game, but it's not about differences in the game. It, it's not about, you know, one, one casino having better craps than another casino. And it's not really about me being treated like a VIP. You know, I like some of the perks that I get for sure at win as a, you know, and we'll talk more about it, but as I've you know, reached the black level, I, I definitely like that. And it's fun to have that. But for me, it's, it's, you know, where am I having the most fun and where am I enjoying the experience the most? And, and I have reached a point where, you know, I like a really nice bed and I like a really nice room and I like really nice room service. And occasionally I like a nice spa and, you know, and those kind of things. And so that's why I've chosen to, to not, you know, be a big player at, and I'm going to throw a property under the bus. I don't mean to, but let's say Excalibur. Sure. You know, yeah. um, I could stay at the dirty castle and probably get the penthouse suite. And <laughs> I don't know probably if that's could. true or not, but you know, and, and again, I, I would have a wonderful time, but it would be a different time. And that's just, for me, it's not a, it, I, it's not as important that I'm a small fish in a big pond uh, as opposed to a big fish in a little pond. I just like the experience of, of win and properties like Bellagio and that kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm the exact same as you. I think one of the reasons we became such decent friends recently is because we are so similar. Um, I mean, you're, you're not a blackjack player and I won't hold that against you. And I can't stand Heidi's as a slot. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, outside of that, I feel like we're, we're pretty much the same player and we value pretty much the same things at these properties. I've never been a person in my life that really cared what other people thought of me. I'm not going out of my way to wear fancy suits every time I walk up to a wind table. I'm typically he's not. In he's jeans not. And he t- really isn't. I was going to say, you can ask Josh. I'm, I'm in jeans and a t-shirt 99% of the time. Um, I just, those things don't bother me, but I do care about getting, you know, I, I, I want some good room service every once in a while. I want, I want a room that looks nice, but more importantly, I want a host that makes me feel like I'm really, you know, valued and welcome at this property. And between the hosts that win and more importantly, the dealers that they have there, I could never turn my back on them because everybody that works there from the janitor to the front desk, to the cashiers, to the dealers, to the host, everybody is over the top nice 
and does everything they can to make sure that you have a perfect stay while you're there. That's a really good point, Chris. That's a really good point. It, it's those relationships are key too. And I mean, the reason that I want to go back to Bellagio, even though, you know, Wynn takes great care of me is because I miss the dealers there. I miss those relationships. And Same I thing. think it, I didn't think of that as I was saying it, but you're right. If I had those relationships with dealers at Excalibur again, I'm sure I would go back there. It's just, oh, sure. you know, I have the dealers that win know me and they say, you know, hi, when I come up and they recognize me and, and it that makes it fun to go back. The cashier at the Tower Suites bar knows what you want before you even get down there in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Chris got to see that on the last trip. It's, it's kind oh, of fun. Yeah. The, yeah, boy. The coffee. She, I mean, she was friendly for... to me, but boy, when Miss, you know, when Josh gets off the elevator, holy cow, man. I mean, no, just it's not, it's not all carpet. that exciting. It's, but oh, they know, was, my, they know think, my drink. They recognize me. And, and I think lights and, went off, some sounds played. <laughs> I mean, there were some things happening there. <laughs> Okay, I don't, even, so, I don't even have to give my room number. It's kind of fun, you know. No, they, they yeah, they look you up by name. They they're, they're good. They know who you right. are. But that that's okay. the thing. It's it's you know, um, you know, I, it would be fun to stay in a villa at you know a property or or and I've yeah, never stayed maybe. in a penthouse suite and you know that kind of thing. All that would be fun. But truthfully, did you not again? It's, you know, did you not mm-hmm. at Resorts World? No, it wasn't a penthouse suite. It was just a boy. I had this crazy this crazy room there once that. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll probably do another, another whole experience on oh, the different yeah. rooms. We've had another conversation on the rooms we've had, but it was a two King bedroom suite that they put me in. And this thing was, was yeah, somehow I, I mean, we'll go into this some other time, but I was the resorts world player when they first opened. I had a terrific host there. I pass her information off to Josh and we get there this trip and I'm on the 66th floor, the top floor. And I have a really nice, you know, sweet that's terrific and there's nothing to complain about because all their rooms are amazing but josh started sending me messages that he's got this you know 14 bedroom 5,000 square foot suite <laughs> that has a pool table and its own swimming <laughs> no, pool it and have a pool table. it had all this shit and i was trying to figure out how he got this but obviously you are far more important than i am just I'm like just, it went just charming it was uh, it was fun to have you know a, what you know me all by myself in a room with three bathrooms it was, that's all oh yeah i mean you can just well, you, I mean, keep in mind, I have had that room at Bellagio where I yes, got two you and a half bathroom. Yeah, the three bathroom room at Bellagio, yeah, I mean, too. <laughs> good, good for me. <laughs> what is that? Their petite salon suite or whatever they call it now? Okay, so let's get to the next question real quick because somehow, Josh, we're already 45 minutes in and we have plenty more that we could talk about. But, okay, this is probably one of my favorite questions of the week. And I have a feeling before we even talk about this, we're going to lose listeners and I'm going to lose some Twitter followers at the end of the day. Uh-oh. But dice control <laughs> came up a lot. <laughs> And boy, did Josh and I have some experience with this this week. Uh, But the question kept getting posed, do we believe in dice control? And then they went on to ask a couple questions about blackjack that I'll save for later. But Josh, do you believe in dice control? I don't believe in dice control, but I'm willing to say that it's fun to pretend that it works. Yes, I fully, <laughs> I fully support that. And we did that this week and it was probably the hardest I have laughed in right. 10 years. I'm not even going to lie. I, no, so, I do not believe in dice control. <laughs> I don't believe in dice influencing. Most so of the this, people that this, I see on YouTube doing this sort of thing are frauds. If they could truly do this, they would be doing it themselves and making money off of it. They wouldn't be trying to sell you their system for a thousand dollars, then blame you when it goes wrong. Please unfollow me if you disagree. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> but as a math and science based person, there's really nothing there. I think Stanford Wong did one article one time that potentially could support the idea of it, but nothing else came past that point. And there has never been any legitimate study that has ever proven it's legit. But Josh, do you want to talk about what happened on Tuesday of this week? <laughs> sure. But first I'll say, I, I'm not going to go quite out for folks that want to unfollow Chris. I'm not going to go quite out <laughs> as far. Keep following Josh. He's on right. your side still. <laughs> I'm not going to go quite out as far on that limb, except to say, I, I don't believe, you know, I, I don't have the, the math and science data behind me. I believe, I believe that it does not support that dice control works, but I, I'm willing to entertain it. Um I would try not to get myself sucked into any product that, you know, any, any training that I was paying for somebody to coach me on how to do dice control, but I'm all for whatever, you know, and again, not to go back to, to Mike and Dr. Mark and Dr. Mike, but if you're having fun, whatever floats your boat uh, works for me. I agree. And <laughs> so, but back to your, back to your, uh, your prompt, Chris. 
So we, we were playing and, and somehow dice control came up and I said, I'm going to, and the point was an eight. I think I already had established an eight. And I said, I'm going to set the, set the dice to, to, uh, two deuces, uh, on, you know, up and throw them in kind of the way that a dice controller throws them that, that lob flick thing that, yeah. that we've all seen. Sure enough, I throw them and an eight comes right away. <laughs> Yeah, straight back. <laughs> we're like, yeah. it works. Yeah, and we pay the started. line. We have a straight winner there. <laughs> so I kept doing it, and I had a really nice roll. You know, setting it to the to the two deuces up. You know, up uh, on top. Yeah. I don't even know how choosing to talk. arbitrary can... sets based off right. arbitrary points that this meant was, nothing. This was my, and so we were just joking. You know, this is my this is my eight set, and then a nine would come, and we would sit, and I would set them two fives up and throw it, and I made the point or whatever. You know, this is my nine set. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and it, it, the, you know, and we had one of those, and this is the the danger I think to to folks that want to buy into it is we had some great rolls that session. We did with our dice setting, which was absolutely meaningless because we weren't setting the dice. You know, there was no strategy behind it other than we would pick the same dice set as we threw. But the, you know, it was it was completely artificial, but yet it worked. And that yes. just goes to you know to, goes to the fact that it's it it is just random. I, I mean, I think you hit maybe three points, almost straight back. Right. Um, and then it was only Josh and I at the table at the time. So the dice passed to me and I was on his right. I came out on, I don't know what it was, a 10. And I said, and Josh goes, well, obviously you set that as boxcars. That's the set for it. So I set it as boxcars, <laughs> throw it down the table, 10 right back, winner. <laughs> we do the same thing coming back out, establish a set, you know, establish a six. He goes, oh, that's that's a five four set every day. <laughs> set it like that, tossed it down, straight back six. I think I made four points in a row, you know, set up and then made the point. It, it was, was a I lot mean, of it was just fun. number point, number point. It was insane. So out of our past like twelve rolls, like six of them had been winners on points that were established with this bullshit. Uh, now, of course, I don't agree with it, but here's what I will tell you: the most dangerous thing for players trying this sort of thing is winning. Uh, the same thing yes. exists at blackjack tables. When people start doing stupid stuff, they start splitting faces, splitting cards that should never be split, doubling down on eight, things like that. The problem is when they win doing it. It's fine and fun if you lose, but if you win, you really start to believe that that is the correct thing to do. And we're dealing with such small sample sizes, it's meaningless. Josh and I could throw a thousand rolls and it has no bearing on the future, on what's going to come. And it really can't give you any sort of subset of data. It's just well, not your, big enough. To your point, Chris, I was playing a session after you'd gone and I was still throwing with those two deuces. Uh -huh. and, and You didn't and, make six straight points? <laughs> well, no, I was having some really nice rolls. And that, oh, that geez. <laughs> so I continued it, not because I believe that that was the proper set, but it was, you yes. know, the, the superstition got to me a little bit or the, or the, you know, just the, <laughs> the, the fun side of it is this is working. And, you know, I think that's all well and good as long as you don't, you know, believe that that actually is the case. If it's, that's a, if it's working for you this session and if it's fun and if you're enjoying it, great. Now, I worry about, I don't know if you think about this too, Chris, but you know, you see people, I don't want people to think I know what I'm doing. You know, they see me no, throwing the no. dice in a particular way. It's like, please, no. don't, please don't bet extra thinking that this is going to, you know. No, you're, you're 100% right, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mike. Uh, I mean, that is that is 100% true. Uh, as somebody that has been backed off of multiple tables in Vegas, always blackjack tables, I never want any desire for a floor person to want to remove me, especially from when. And some people are dumber than others. So you could have somebody see you make seven straight points and think, wow, this guy's really doing something he shouldn't. Right. Um, so no, I, I always try to be as facetious and joking with these sort of things as I possibly can be so that they know we don't truly really take this seriously. And then the people that do, you guys go crazy and whatever happens, happens. We'll all be fine. <laughs> okay. We, we could go on about that for a long time because obviously I have a strong opinion on it. Uh, but Josh here, let's take it a little bit lighter. What is your favorite show or two in Vegas if you're going? Oh gosh. Um, so it's been a while since I've been to one. Because you know, really, it's it's you know, most of the trips now are are gambling and and you know, if I'm by myself, it's gambling and room service. If I'm with friends, it's you know, a few nice dinners and gambling, and we might go downtown and that kind of thing. But it's been a little while since I've seen a show. I think I think the last show I saw was was absinthe. absinthe. Is it absinthe or absinthe? Absinthe at Caesar's Palace. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, which was Fort phenomenal. Um, I thought it was great. But it's been, you know, I mean, I've seen all the, 
I think I've seen most of the Cirque du Soleil shows. Um, was not a big fan of Ka, uh, but really liked, you know, I've, I've seen O a couple times. I've seen Miss Deer a couple times. I saw Zumanity. Um, you know, don't be laughing about Zumanity. I'm actually really sad that that show closed. Oh, me too. I saw, no, it, no. I saw it twice. I thought it was terrific. Both I times. Went down, I went down there and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not casting aspersions or, or passing judgment, but I went down there with my buddy and the two of us sat in the, in the love seat and watched Zumanity. Oh, <laughs> I did that with a with my, with a girlfriend at the time, and I've done that with a couple actual uh, male friends as well. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, I've been right yeah. there. I've had I've had that six hundred pound woman come up and rub her butt in my face and hand me strawberries. Yeah, I've done it all there. I, I, I thought really humanity understand. was was a great was a great Cirque du Soleil I did show. Too. But but I think you know for uh, I'd like to take my daughter to to see O sometime when we go down. I'd like to see. I still really want to see Penn and Teller at some point. It's terrific. Um, I love I Penn and seen, Teller. I haven't seen them. But yeah, I mean, uh, Caesars, so you know, it's, I'm not the best for for shows anymore, unfortunately. How about you? I mean, Caesars used to give you free tickets um, as a diamond, right. um, and Penn and Teller was always on that list. So that was one show I always tried to catch every trip. Um, was them because that was a good use of your tickets. Uh, another Caesars guy that's I think now moved. Uh, Mac King, his magic yeah. show, his comedy yeah, magic yeah. show. Mac's actually from Kentucky. Um, where I'm from. Um, so I've actually seen him here locally. He lives locally. I actually see him at the casino here every once in a while. Um, we we'll, won't go on too much about that. Um, <laughs> uh, but Mac was always terrific at Harrah's and I'm, I'm not sure where he's moved to now. I think it's an MGM property. Uh, but definitely recommend that absinthe is by far the best show in Vegas. I agree with you hundred percent on that. All the Spiegel world shows are good. I don't yeah. know if you've seen opium at Cosmo. Uh, it, I haven't. I want to. Yeah. It's, it's very good. Let's go next time. You know, we'll get tickets. We can do that. I got plenty of comp dollars to use. <laughs> um, Opian's terrific. Um, big fan of that. And I know with different girlfriends in the past, I've gone and seen a lot of those burlesque shows around town, ex burlesque and, you know, country burlesque and all those stuff. All those I are got, absolutely. A, this is a story for another podcast, but I got called up on stage on one of the country burlesque shows one time. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, that would be the only thing to keep me awake during one of those shows because it, it was terrible. So horrible. It was terrible. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> um, if you do like those sort of shows, though, I always recommend Fantasy at Luxor. Um, that's by far the best of those groups if that's something you're into. And at least for me, Josh, it's it's never been me wanting to go to these shows. It's usually been girlfriend, wife, whatever it happens to be that right. wanted to do these things. Um, well, I, so I a, do reckon. Oh, I was going to sorry. I, I have a buddy that I go to Vegas, not as much anymore, but I used to go to Vegas, you know, once or twice a year with it. He is not really a gambler. He's much more of a go to shows and he would he would always pick a, you know, one burlesque type show, you know, a topless type show and one show that was, yeah. you know, a standard, you know, Cirque du Soleil show or whatever. And, and uh, so I'm the same way. I, I've been to a lot of them. I mean, I've seen, you know, back when she was at Caesars, I saw Celine, I've seen Cher, I've seen, you know, I've seen, I've seen lots of shows in Vegas, but it's been a while. Um, you know, now occasionally I'll go to, I got to go to the Academy of Country Music Awards. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> That's, yes, exactly. I just had to throw that out there. Uh, yeah. But it's, but it's, uh, no, it, don't you're the, your horn, you're the, horn a little you're more there. current show guy, would you say? I said, don't toot your horn too much there. You know, you know <laughs> I mean, the head's getting a little too big here. That's right. <laughs> But no, I, I hear you on that. Um, so let, let's start to wrap this up so we can save plenty of stuff for next time. And so it doesn't get too darn late here. But uh, Josh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap this thing up? I think that uh, this is a story I wanted to tell you about. You had gone. Chris had gone from our last trip. Okay, so this is Wednesday morning. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And there was a guy playing, playing at win, and there was a guy that uh, came up at you know, I'm, I'm playing and, and, you know, the usual way I play, you know, numbers across and, and having a decent role, not a bad, there were a few other people at the table and we were doing okay. And a, a guy, guy came in and he bought in for $25,000 cash, which was, okay. you know, you don't see that too often. It's fairly strange, mm-hmm. but yeah, it he, happens had a, he had a bag of cash and he, and he lost it all. We, you know, table went south a little bit and he lost it all in probably 10, 15 minutes. Okay. And we kept playing. We had another great role. <laughs> and I, you know, made it, made a good amount. And back he comes, he lost another $25,000. And then he left and we had a great role. And I was talking to the dealers and, and they said, you know, it's not a big deal for him. He comes, you know, he comes all the time. And, but it was one of those things that, you know, with craps is so, the variance in craps is so, can be so huge that if you miss that, you know, that one role, I mean, again, not to always go back to Mark and Dr. Mike, but, if you can hang on for that one big roll, which of course is not guaranteed and might never come, and 
but yes. that can make all the difference. And in crafts, it, you know, you can be down quite a bit and make a swing and go, you know, way above whatever you're buying is. Of course, that's not guaranteed and, and more often than not won't happen. But when it does happen, it's it's special. And I felt really bad for this guy. You know, who knows what his, what his sure. financial situation was, but he kept missing these. You know, we had two really nice, you know, parts of the session that he missed both of them. And it turned out he had gone to the to the uh, upstairs craps tables at the win, which I have not seen uh, or ever been invited to and aspired to. Nor have time, I. But, but uh, I ended up cashing out with him. I was, cashing, you know, at the cage and, and here he comes with $50,000 in, in chips and got, so he at least got some of his money back because they gave him $50,000 in cash, which is probably the most cash I think I've ever seen. Uh, and he had a, that's he a had a black pouch and yeah. Anyway, that's what I have as we, which is just the, the moral is never leave the craps table. Pretty much. Um, <clears throat> the saddest part for me is always leaving earlier than you since I'm an East Coaster and having to catch that long flight back because it seems every time I leave, you have an amazing role where you make them all like three <laughs> times on the same shooter. You got all your bets pressed up to like a thousand dollars across the board. Uh, I, I don't know how that works, but I, I got to stop missing out on these things. But you are right. Craps variants, especially if you're a better like we are that's betting across the board. It's horrible. An immediate seven just destroys you. You can lose five grand in five minutes. It happens all the time. Um, it's all about bankroll management, just having enough to see if you can hang on for that big swing to come. And eventually it almost always does. You get a good chunk of it back. I can't tell you how many times Josh and I have been at a table, be down six, nine grand, and then one shooter comes where it all just clicks. And next thing you know, you're up 10 grand. Um, it happens. Uh, you just got to hang around for it sometimes. But unfortunately, it usually happens the day after I leave while you're sitting there by yourself. So I'm just going to assume that it's a lie. It never happened. And you're just That's trying right. to make me jealous. Never happened. I will say that the last the last day was a positive day and brought me back a little bit from I still finished a little bit on the hole, but uh, not not where I was. So that was a nice. Uh, but yeah, you, you just enjoyed yourself leave. again. Never, never leave yeah. the. Yeah, yeah, never leave the craps table. And quite frankly, at least on Tuesday while I was there, we did not leave the craps table. No. Uh, I, I think we got over 10 hours of play in, which is by far the most hours I think I've ever put in in a day on anything. Uh, legs were sore by the end of the day from standing there so long. Well, uh, and people, people kind of looked at us it, weird, but <laughs> it was people fun. people listening, if anybody's done it, 10 hours at a craps table is, I mean, we took a few breaks. We took a lunch break at, you know, at some time and... and but over the course of the day, 10 hours. And that yeah, is 10 a hours. lot of craps. It's a lot of craps. And That's a lot we of We both got back to our, our rooms and we're texting each other and just, we were beat. Just oh, beat. Yeah. <laughs> drained. Absolutely <laughs> drained. I felt like I'd run a marathon just from doing that for the whole Standing day. Standing at the craps table. Oh my gosh. Okay, guys. So if you'd like to donate to cost the, and help the cost of hosting the site or the podcast or anything else you have in mind, you can click the button found on our homepage at crapvegas.com. We're going to put that website out for everybody multiple times over the next couple of weeks to let you know about the, the new site that's going. Even more exciting, there's a merch store on there. It only has two products in it because we are just boring people. We don't have anything else to shell. But uh, there is a Vegas Duffy t-shirt. Um, if you ever <laughs> wanted to know how Josh makes his uh, hard way parlays, this shirt will take care of it for you. <laughs> you can point to your shirt and tell the dealer, do this. And then you can flip around to the back of the shirt and have the second part of the parlay. Um, so you are set up for life if you grab a Vegas Duffy t-shirt. Uh, Josh and I are going to be heading back to Vegas June 10th through the 14th, staying at Wynn, of course. Uh, and like any other time, we'd love to meet as many of you as we possibly can. You are always welcome to join us at the tables. Just you know, send us a tweet, send us a DM, send us a text, whatever you want to do. We'll tell you where we're going to be. It's almost always at the exact same table there. Um, so we're, we're pretty easy to find. Uh, but outside of that, guys, we'll try to get back to this, hopefully on a somewhat regular schedule. Josh is not going to commit to anything. He is the uh, Dr. Mike of this group. It's never me, folks, I think is what Mark would say. <laughs> and that is 100% the case. It's never me. It's Josh. But we will get back and do this again soon. Anything before we run, Josh? Now we have the, now that we have the first one under our belt and we figured out how to. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's just it's you know, going now. We can't the sound stop. comes through. And yeah, it'll. it'll uh, no, no, we're we're so fully long. convinced that when I hit the stop button here in just a second, that there is going to be no audio from either one of us. And then we're just going to close the site down and pretend that we never even mentioned it. That's possible. And if you, if you listen this far, I want to hear from people if they like the opening.
Oh yes, that uh, that initial clip when you come in, and I'll post a copy of it on Twitter tonight. Uh, that that is Josh's finding that he is uh, very proud of, and it makes me laugh every single damn time I hear it. Um, so uh, we do appreciate you all for listening. Thanks, we'll everybody. see how this goes, and if you have anything else, just let us know. We'll talk to you guys next time. Vegas, here we come. Thanks for listening to the Crap Vegas Podcast. Have you ever been to Vegas? Check out all our recent news and our Vegas trip calendar by visiting crapvegas.com. See you in Vegas.